last year, uh, I talked about a simple lock-free queue. And then this year, I was working on uh, the lock-free queue. And it was getting very complicated. And basically, last year, we left off with it looking like this, where by looking at any one item in the queue, because you can only look at one thing at a time in lock-free programming, you can actually figure out where the start of the queue is. And I'm working on this, and I thought, it's going to get really complicated, and I need to write some rules of lock-free programming because it's not just show people how it's done, how do you think about it? So the first rule of lock-free programming is, of course, don't talk about lock-free programming. <laughs> so that's the end of that talk. Uh, how much time we got left? Ah, uh, OK. I thought it was going to be longer, sorry. Uh, questions? I, I won't actually answer them because I can't talk about lock-free programming. Second rule of lock-free programming. I do have bonus slides. <laughs> okay, the second rule of lock-free programming, or programming in general. First rule is still don't talk about lock-free programming. Second rule is use locks. I use that. I use that every time. And the third rule is macros are evil. Those are the okay. So it's still what eighty-eight minutes, eighty-seven minutes. All right. Uh, <laughs> Huh, okay, I thought that was going to take longer. All right, I got bonus slides. <laughs> okay, postmodern C++. An overview. Uh, this whole talk is a whole pile of clickbait of, of, that I posted on Twitter. So I'm going to, uh, this one doesn't sound as clickbaity because it might actually be worthwhile. Um, how to concentrate on one section of a program at a time, how to test in isolation. Taking metaprogramming to a whole new level. It will shock you. Uh, what is postmodern so, uh, C++? Who knows? But you'll never believe what a postmodern smart pointer looks like. That, that will be coming. And I will perform mind control on the audience. At least some members of the audience. That is, that is the goal for today. Um, and the, you know the other part of this overview, this whole talk is themed over Twitter, because I have posted all the sections of my talk on Twitter already. So expect to see a lot of Twitter. But I also need graphs, because graphs you need graphs in every talk, right? Here's a graph of talks I've done in the past. I do low-level talks, like lock-free programming, and I do typically really high-level talks. And I rarely do talks that are in between. This is like my only talk I did was about Thread safe observer. It was kind of like a middle of the road talk. So this is kind of a high level talk, okay? Just to warn you. And here's a graph of humor per slide. The scale is different. The other, you know, I'm not trying to get up to a 10 or anything here. But some of this is kind of lighthearted, just to warn you. Um, so uh, I wasn't on Twitter. I like to ignore Twitter because it's a crazy place. Um, but people were talking about me on Twitter. Is Jens here? Well, He's, oh, right there. Yeah, you, gave me, you just gave me a shirt a minute ago. So, uh, you know, uh, Billy McNeil at Microsoft was doing some lock-free stuff, and Yen said, you should talk to Tony. So I don't think there was any pentagrams involved or anything, but I was summoned, and, uh, and now I'm on Twitter. But you can't talk about lock-free in 140 characters. So um, Later on, once again, Yen started all this. Uh, he, there, we got into this conversation about what is modern C++ because modern C++ has, you know, we've been calling it that for, for years and years. And it's like, what now is modern C++? And this got to be a really long conversation. And uh, it was pointed out, you know, Scott Myers, you know, there, there's that, that book, but that's C++ in 14. So that's somehow modern C++. Um, well, you can't even see this one. That one's highlighted because that was Patrice who was pointing that out. Um, and then the conversation continued on for a while. And then we realized, no, no, modern C++ started in, with Alexandrescu's book. And that book is in 2001. So we've been doing modern C++. It's old, right? It's 2001 technology. 98. What's that? It's 98. 98 because? Garnier, paper. Oh. Okay, I should, yeah, I, I fail, all right. So this, this is the great part about this conference, is someone always corrects you. Uh, <laughs> Bjarne had a, had, a, had a paper in 98 talking about modern C++, so that, that, would, that would be nice if I had that as, it's nice that Bjarne is the one who started it, I like that. Um, 
So at the very end, uh, we're trying to figure out what to call this, and Patrice was like, modern, more modern, more, more modern as, as years go on. And so the obvious answer uh, is postmodern, right? That, that's, that's what the next, next thing is. And so I said, you know, Scott's Scott Myers is retiring from C++, my book will, will be called Postmodern C++, and, and you're not allowed to use that title. And I'll never get around to writing the book. This is about as far as I'm going to get is, is a talk. Uh, but it's still my book title. I claim it. I claim all, you know, I claim the whole uh, hashtag now. That's my hashtag. You can't use it. Um, and Patrice was like, if it, you know, are you really going to do postmodernism? And I said, well, I have to, right? I, I have no choice. That's, that's the title. So um, does anyone here actually understand what postmodernism is? Because if you do, please leave. <laughs> because my goal is to just make it mean whatever I want it to mean for the purpose of my talk. And if you know a lot about postmodernism, you'll find out that's kind of what it is anyhow. People just make stuff up. It's, it's very much, uh, uh, you know. Uh, so let's just jump into the first, my first posting of postmodernism. So the meaning of a container is a deference it has with containers that it is not. So true. This, this, this slide was not on the humor <laughs> graph. Good. They're all on the humor graph. Anyhow, there's this guy, Jacques Derrida, uh, who was basically one of the founders of postmodernism. And he, made, he coined this term. This is not just, even in French, this is not actually exactly a word. It's a mix of the word uh, difference and deference in, in French because his theory is that any word you're using, it's why did I say house in, in a sentence? In, you know, I'm writing some, something down and I said the word house. Why didn't I say mansion? Why didn't I say shed? Why, you know, why did I pick that word? Every word that you choose is actually defined by the word you didn't choose. And this is what postmodern people, you know, how they go about thinking things. And also that, that means that the meaning of every word is deferred to the meanings of those other words that it isn't. And so meaning is always deferred down the road. And even if you had a dictionary and just learned every word and how it related to the other words, you should go into older dictionaries to see what the word used to mean. And, and it just goes on forever and you can never have meaning at all. That's, that's the postmodern nihilism. Um, but it, it's true. Like vec when you see someone uh, chooses a container in their code, uh, you think, why did they choose that container? Like, what, what's, you know, you choose a vector for certain properties, you choose a list for other properties, right? So when you see someone cho make it, made a choice, uh, if he chose vector, you don't question it, because that's just the right one to use. You just always use vector. If he chooses any other container, you question him. Why did you choose that container? And he might say, I chose this one because I needed my iterators to not get invalidated, or, you know, some reason. He has some, but, that, that's, that is how our containers are defined. They're defined by each one has particular properties related to the other uh, containers. So in some sense, uh, postmodernism actually does work. Um, except for vector, vector pool, just avoid that one. Um, this was yesterday. This was, this was a tweet from yesterday from Jonathan Cave. Uh, and it, it's about the, the prime minister, or Tashek of, Tashek of, of, uh, Ireland, yeah, um, who's resigning or something. And, you know, they said he's been a strong, consistent friend. And, you know, he thought, why did they say strong and consistent? Usually you hear stuff like strong and stable. That's, that sounds better. You hear it more often. So that's, that's difference in, in practice, just in English, right? Like, these are the words chosen, but you're thinking of other words that, why didn't they use, you know, is the guy unstable? He couldn't use that word? Like, I don't know if that's what he's trying to imply by his tweet, but it might, it might be. I don't know anything about British politics. Um, so that's kind of an example of deference. Um, right, so I have a million examples. Um, there's the real-life example. I have a class called Connected Image in my code base that when, after you touch the pixels in it, write some pixels to it, it automatically like notifies and updates and probably goes out a projector somewhere or something like that. And every design decision I made in this class, the guy that I'm working with questioned every one of them. He's like, why are you using standard function instead of a, a virtual function? I'm like, well, because I want to change it at runtime. He's like, why are you doing it this way instead of doing that? Like, and every pattern I was using was not the usual pattern. But I had a reason for every single one. 
Of course, I didn't write down the reason. I thought, why are you questioning me? That's, you know. <laughs> but he's right. Like, they, they were all, I wasn't choosing vector. I was choosing some other thing that wasn't the, I mean, standard function isn't that crazy. That's, that's a pretty normal one. He should, I think he should have been able to guess why I was using standard function. But there was a whole pieces of the class where, yes, you're right to question why I did it this way. Um, and uh, that's the other example. And the, so once you have difference or deference, uh, and you start looking at why someone chose these words and stuff, you can go one step further in this thing called deconstruction, which is you purposely look at the main words and replace them with their opposites and see if you get anywhere. And uh, this happens in architecture where you say, you know, architecture is in essence defining the space, you know, the space in this room and the space in the front room and all this stuff. And you're like, well, what if it's not the space? What if it's actually the things that happen in the space? That's what defines architecture. And everyone's like, no, no, it's the space. And you're like, no, you don't build this building because I wanted a big volume of air. I built, you know, this building is built because I want lots of people to fit in it. So it turns out when you start turning things around in your mind, you get new insights into the thing you're working on. So in architecture, people did this and actually are like, wait a second, I'm now going to change the way I do architecture because I've started inverting some of these thoughts and see where it leads. And sometimes it leads to insanity. So this is another example, right? Like you have unsigned int, you can have unsigned this. It's like, why isn't there unsigned float, right? And either that leads to an insight or it doesn't. But uh, did they already discuss unsigned versus signed at the, at the lightning talks or is that tonight? So, so here's my argument. No one is begging for unsigned float. So why are you so tied to unsigned int, right? Uh, to me, unsigned int is for, for twiddling bits, not for making sure it's not negative because I haven't seen anyone try to, and probably someone has gone up there and tried to write an unsigned float. It, it, you know, maybe, but it's not, no one's clamoring for it, right? Yeah, ooh, yeah, that one more bit too, that's really useful. If you're on your last bit, you're already in trouble. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the introduction of postmodernism. Unsigned double? Yeah, that's even better, right? Unsigned log double. Um, so I'll just, next one. Uh, API is defined by the code that calls it, not the code that implements it. Uh, which is another, let's invert the usual thinking of an API. Usually you get like, I've got this class, it's got a bunch of member functions, these are what they do, so that must be the API. But um, if you really think about it, it's like, no, it's the other way around. You look at how this class is to be used, you look at your usage. Um, before I get to that, actually, I should mention, uh, when I had to switch my tag because, you know, never name a language with one letter and symbols because you can't search for it. Um, and JF. The F bastion is like postmodern C, you need modern C first. So, because that's what that's what this ends up searching for, right? Um, but you know, the question is, if we deconstruct this, do we get any insight? And I think you get that you should design an API by usage patterns. How are people planning on using this API? And then also write your usage first, write your tests first, because then you see how this API should get used. You get a real feel for what your API should be. And the other part is, once you have written an API and you go look at how your people are using it and realize they're using it not how you expected, most of the times you're kind of stuck. Like you can kind of maybe teach them, no, no, this is the right way, but they might be going, no, no, this is really useful. I'm going to keep using it this way because this is useful. You're like, no, I designed it to be this. And it's like, no, you're stuck. You're, you're indebted to your users because it's your users who define what your API really is. So that's, this is, this is a high level talk. This is like, insights, hopefully something that you can take away that uh, you, make, you can go, go back and think about. We use the word foo to convey no meaning, but that is the meaning it conveys. Uh, I'll, I'll, if you go read postmodern uh, criticisms and stuff, they, they like to be ironic. Um, uh, that's first word is irony. Irony, despair, and the ultimate deferral of and deference, right? Like you put the word foo in an example or something because you want to say, look at the other words. This is not the important word. The other words are the important words. Um, and it's just a placeholder, right? Um, but in, in uh, you know, the irony is that you can't, you can't actually remove all meaning from a word because it, it has some meaning to it. Okay, I'm going kind of fast actually. 
Uh, consider the bracket styles within the context of the social economic society in which they were formed. Michael's bracket style has, has been increasing. So that, this, is, I was trying, this is my bad attempt at trying to sound like a real postmodern uh, lit crit guy. But I should have said this. The essential paradigm of cyberspace is creating partially situated identities out of actual and potential social reality in terms of canonical forms of human contact, thus renormalizing the phenomenology of narrative space and requiring the naturalization of intersubjective cognitive strategy and thereby resolving the dialectics of metaphorical thoughts, each problematic to the other, collectively redefining and reifying the paradigm of the parable of the model of the metaphor. So, yeah, this, someone presented this at a, at a coding thing, it, it, or actually maybe at a, or possibly at a post, he went, to, no, I was actually at a, at a postmodernism conference or something, and he wasn't a postmodernist. All these phrases he just took from other talks and just <laughs> stuffed them together. And he said most of the audience for like halfway through were just like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then by the end, everyone's like, wait a second. <laughs> So, but I think this actually does, it, this is talking about avatars and Twitter and, and YouTube comments, if, if I read it correctly. Um, but uh, I actually, uh, I have one more thing about bracketing. Uh, and, and how we write is as important as what we write. If an if statement's on a single line, the compiler should realize that that's probably an unlikely branch, right? And, and then JF is like, you know, if it's got the word error or exception or it throws, that's an unlikely branch. And so, first of all, we got to realize that JF is a, is, is, doesn't he work on, he is a just-in-time compiler. Um, so usually whatever he's saying, he's, he's joking. And he is the C++, C++ Standards Committee punster. He has a, um, he, all, his, all his papers have great titles. His last one was uh, Hotel California, because in the parallel algorithms that are in 17 now, you can throw exceptions, but they can never leave. So anyhow, you know he's he's making fun, but at the same time he works on LLVM and all this stuff. He could he could implement this if he you know it's not unheard of to think is that actually possible to have the compiler go oh that little if branch that's probably not going to happen. Um, but what I really want to talk about is like let's just go religious here and talk about uh, coding styles because why not right? So the first one is wrong. It's bad. <laughs> why is it bad? Yes, it's because it's in red. I like the way you're thinking. You're thinking on the right level here. So that one's the only one I say is just like wrong because I can't set a breakpoint on statement, right? I mean, I, there's ways to do it, but it's hard. You can't just like one key set a breakpoint there. Better IDE. Yeah, better ID, but it's still going to be a good IDE will make setting a normal breakpoint easy in favor, like this is always going to be harder because it's less useful. So you favor the common thing over, and you you know the, the uncommon actions have to pay for the common actions. So I would think a good ID is going to make this harder because it is uncommon. Um, the second one, uh, it's in purple. Uh, people complain about that, right? Like, oh, I'm going to add another statement and then and I'm going to forget to put the brackets. I've never done that in my life. I, I don't <laughs> think, like, maybe if you write lots of Python or something, you're going to fall into that. But now we, a good IDE will probably automatically uh, unindent that second statement. So this actually doesn't bother me that much. And then this one, I, I like, I, I'm fine with people having their religious opinions, but at least the first two have uh, some some rationalization behind it. Between this and this, I think it's just, there's, there's no rationalization, right? So, when one has no form, one can be any, all forms. When one has no style, he can fit in with any style. I've given up. I don't have a coding style anymore. I use, what I, if anything, I have a coding style, it's like, if it's small, I do it this way, and if it's big if statement, I do it that way. And it's actually more like, if it's significant and you should be looking at it, I'd probably put my brackets here. If it's kind of, oh, this is just checking an error and then we're going to get out of here. I do it like that. And uh, semi-regular guy here, uh, attendee, uh, Fabio Fracassi, who's also on the committee, uh, he's the one who he's, he said he did this. And I was just like, no, you can't do that. You must choose one. 
And he's like, no, no, I pick them depending on, you know, what, what's needed in the code. And I was just like, yeah, okay, that makes complete sense. Um, and, and it's this, right? We, we have, we only have so much syntax we can work with. We're kind of fixed in, as to how we, we, we're not, we're not writing literature. Yes? Life is too short to manually format your code. Um, I don't like having my code automatically formatted because I lose the ability to communicate with my formatting. Michael? Yes, code should be beautiful. <laughs> and an unnamed form formatter does not do that? Okay. Um, well, let's go one step further. <laughs> I didn't even catch that one. Oh. Life is long enough to create great art. Okay, got it. Um, jumping right back to literature, here's a book, and it's uh, you know more a credi, uh, Death on the Installment Plan. At this pat at this point in the book, the guy is you know suffering a breakdown. So the text, looking at the text without even reading it, you see that he is suffering a breakdown, right? It's like bringing the, the context you know, up to a higher level. Um, and then this code here, obviously, everyone, have, have, have people have seen this before? This is fairly, this calculates pi, obviously. Um, and and it, 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 I, think it, I think it's done such that if you make a bigger circle, it calculates it more accurately. Magic. Um, so I don't really need my code to be that beautiful. I, that you know, but um, but I do think it's important to be able to communicate with with your formatting. Uh, right. I'll be taking metaprogramming to a whole new level. I, I've been. The best part about this is. Once I just decided to do a talk on postmodernism based on my tweets, I started tweeting based on what I wanted to say in the talk. It's kind of... <laughs> this is, this, I, I tried to go as meta as possible. So, so why, why do we code at all? Um, and uh, this one, this was a, a guy I worked with years ago. I think, I'm not even sure that he, he was the one that came up with this, but like, I don't know how we got on this topic one day. He's just like, you write code because you can't be there when they need you to be there. It's like, here's a chunk of my thought pattern, and I'll just put it down in code, so when that something happens, this is what I would have done when that happens. Right? Um, and this is a weird one because I think it's kind of interesting and somehow insightful, but I don't know how it applies to anything. So I don't know if it's possible <laughs> to have something insightful that doesn't apply. I think it's kind of a requirement that I'm waiting to find how this applies to something. But. At least makes you think a little bit. Uh, oh, I was told to have graphs, part two. So here's a graph of uh, <laughs> graphs, graphs per slide. Yeah. So this was my first my graphs earlier, and, and we're now we're now here. We're already we're we're quite far. I'm going really fast. Sorry. Um, it's okay. I have bonus slides. <laughs> um, there's another graph. Uh, I like this one as well. It's very similar, but just tilt your head. Thanks, well done. Uh, here's another. Uh, well, this is where this originally came from. Like, this is this optical illusion's been around forever. Um, and then uh, let me go back to another graph. Okay, it's a giraffe. It's close. It actually looks like a graph. This is this is where like the, the talk is starting to go downhill. <laughs> this this actually gets a little interesting uh, right here. <laughs> Someone in the audience should correct me though, right? Because this isn't quite accurate. It should be. You know, more like that. And then, uh, okay. I, I think you get the idea, right? So. Just 
I, I, can, I can fix that. A second. Uh, okay. Just a second. I'm just, I think we're okay now. Not quite sure why that happened, but, um, <laughs> you know, maybe I shouldn't use, uh, well, we'll, hmm. Ah, maybe that had something to do with it. That was a really long setup for, <laughs> um, for some reason, lots of people like this tweet. It's like, I actually started this because I wanted to look at, like, because we keep talking about putting um, references inside of optional and how should it work and everything. So I was working on classes where do I want the reference inside my class to actually work like a pointer and do I want it to work like a reference? And this is a case where this is totally self-consistent, right? This, this, but you'd have to write a copy constructor to make sure you correct your, you know, so you couldn't actually, well, then it couldn't be a reference, blah, 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 blah. But, um, and if I just uh, put this in code here and then shorten it a little bit, um, it was actually this long because it had to be 140 characters, right? Just, so. um, and then I realized that uh, it wasn't quite self-referential enough. I should have done this. Yeah. Which also actually fits in the tweet, so you might, may see it later. Uh, and then you get to do this, right? You, you derive from it, and then you can just use self as instead of using your this pointer all the time. <laughs> right? It's, it's a reference, right? This is, people have asked for this, so here, here it is, right? So, Sebastian Reddell's not here uh, this year, but he would have corrected me by now. This, this doesn't compile. Like, I, I'm kind of disappointed in you all. Someone should have pointed out. You need to actually, you have to, have to either be a friend or make it public and do some casting and self should have been protected and everything. But um, that, that would actually work. Um, and, and it's a really bad idea, right? I hope, I hope you all notice that this is a bad idea. Um, besides the fact that you would have trouble deriving more classes off of that and keeping the pointer, or like you have to make it a, make that a virtual base, or like it would just get really, really, really bad. But it's a bad idea because can you imagine a code base that just started using this and you show up and you're like, what is this self thing? Like, what 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 language are you using, right? And I had uh, I had a manager at at Adobe named Paul Young. And I had another manager at Adobe named Paul Young, two different guys. So one of them we called Pablo. Uh, and he said that to me one time when I wrote code like this. You know, we're doing UI code, and I'm constructing some UI widgets, and I'm allocating them, and just I'm not saving the pointer, right? He's like, what are you doing? Like, you're just leaking all these objects. And I'm like, nope, not leaking them. Don't need the pointer. Because they all have parents, and they all get attached to the parent. And even, actually in this case, I didn't even need a parent because they would attach itself to the window handle. So when, you, when the window in, in Windows went away, the class goes away, right? Which may or may not be a good idea, but um, I didn't need the pointer. So he's just, that's when he said, okay, I understand what you're doing. And I even had comment, but the comment kind of got lost a little higher up or whatever, explaining what was going on. And that's when he just said, we already have enough paradigms, do it the way everyone else is coding, even though would cause problems because our other UI things weren't attached to the window, so you would get cases where you have a UI object in code, but you don't have one in the UI, and all these kind of problems. That's what I was trying to solve, but um, he's got a point. It, you, you work on a code base, and if there's one guy doing things differently than everybody else, it's just gonna cause problems, right? Either convince everyone that this way is better, or you know, follow, follow the crowd. Uh, so that's what I have to say about that. Uh, this is from Saturday morning breakfast cereal. So I'll let you read and, you know. Um, and it's funny because I was wanted to write a, t yeah. uh, I wanted to write a tweet about sorting anyhow. Um, and then this showed up and I'm like, okay, I've already got my tweet ready. Every list is already sorted from a certain point of view. 
because postmodernism is all about point of view and everything's relative and um, and actually I was thinking like okay finding the point of view is hard but it turns out that's really easy as well just compare the addresses of the things you're comparing I don't know if that's technically I, I, I think the standard library is allowed to make a copy I'm not sure of the value so that may or may not work and it's dumb so don't don't do it Marshall can tell me if that's correct can I can I rely when I on some kind of sort or something can I rely that the value the reference passed in is not a a copy of the value, or right? But but could you have made it temporary? It would be bad. But why am I doing this? Yeah, I'm insane. Because because of that, all, all all things are already sorted. But anyhow, uh, this is another one where I'm not really sure if there's an insight in that. It's just this is just to have some fun. Um, okay, now now we're talking. How to concentrate on one section of a program at a time without intrusion, and how to test in isolation. Uh, I recently came across a paper that just changes, I think, the way people are, are programming. Um, and it's related to this. Um, postmodernism, you always have to figure out where these things began. At least postmodernism in programming, I say, began in 1951 when David Wheeler, who was the uh, Struchup's thesis advisor, invented the subroutine. I really hope it catches on. So <laughs> let's look at this paper uh, of this great new thing, the subroutine. It's only two pages, and it's chocked full of goodness. Um, so let me, without, before we dive in, uh, just like an overview of what a subroutine is, is it's a self-contained part of a program, an entity of its own. So just think about that. And this is the interesting part. There's no necessity for subroutines. You can write a program with no subroutines. However, it is usually advantageous. Very much an understatement, I think. <laughs> and then reasons will be discussed below. This is just first paragraph. Like this, this, thing's, this thing's awesome. So it allows the coder to concentrate on a, one section of a program at a time without the overall detailed program continually intruding. Who here has been writing code and you're like, I, if I change this, I don't know what's going to happen to the rest of my program, right? Yeah. Come on. So I think this is it. I think this is the key here, this subroutine thing. I think we're, we're on to something. <laughs> um, thus, subroutines can be more easily coded and tested in isolation. These are like this, I think this is, people are starting to call this unit testing. Like this is, uh, oh God, that's like, there's this whole other concept there on top of subroutines is this thing called libraries, where you can actually take the subroutines in a package and somehow take them out of this program and put them into another program, the same subroutine. It's like this is this is only paragraph two, like. Um, but this is kind of, you know, this is bleeding edge stuff, right? Because as he says, um, it's not always possible to write subroutines where that can be moved in memory. Although certain machines, this is now possible. So this is bleeding edge stuff we're talking about here. Okay, is that enough sarcasm? <laughs> I, I, call it whatever you want. I, like separation of concern is often called like is often more like where did you put your data and stuff. But it's just like I, I put this in as big a font as possible because um, uh, people don't write enough functions. It's that's like if I look at what is the number one problem with coding and you're like oh you didn't do your class this blah 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 and you didn't put things in classes like. No, screw classes. You didn't write a function. That is, you should have put that in a function. So as an example, I went through our code base of one of our projects and searched for the phrase step one. And I actually, I don't think it was too bad. I found 20 out of uh, 3,000 files. This is one example that I think is not giving away the, you know, big secrets of our code base. Um, this chunk of code here turns 2D camera points into 3D points, All right? I like the comment, explains what the code's doing and everything. Um, and then later on in the same function, there's a step two with a bunch of code, and a step three with a bunch of code, and a step four, which actually doesn't say step four, it just says what it does. And, and there's actually like six or seven lines of code down here, which I'm not really sure is part of step one, because I think step one is done here. But it's not step two, so I don't know what this code in the middle is. Whenever I see someone who writes step one, I'm like, put that in a function. Just why, why, 
you know. <laughs> so, ah, oh, yeah, just <laughs> right click, refactor. <laughs> Extract, okay. Um, for our code base, some of those blocks were like just three lines of code. Just said, just said step one, three lines of code. So, you know, I don't really expect you to move that into a function probably. Some of them had like actually bracketed, like no, there's no if or while or anything here. It was just a bracket just to say where the step starts and ends. It's like, well, that's kind of nice. But you're, you're really close to making it a function, right? And some of them were actually, you know, those don't count. These are, you know, we have some really nice ASCII art in our, in our code base. Um, that one makes more sense if you could see the whole, but I didn't want to give away our secrets. Uh, but I also found this. Out of those 20, there was uh, six that all had the exact same comment in them, right? Not a good sign. So, honest answer, how many times do you need to see the same block of code before you're like, okay, I'm going to put this into a function? Two, three. Two, three. <laughs> Okay, you're all wrong except for except for one person. The answer is one. Like that that's my point, right? Like I don't care if this ever happens anywhere ever again. Put it in a function. It's it's a thought on its own. You see the code once, put it in a function. Yeah, then the comment, well, the That's 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 why I had this one here. There was no step in it. It it already had a function name, right? And, and I'm not one of those guys who say if you, if you write all your code right, you won't have comments. You still need comments because if this turned into a, into a bunch of code that said, you know, convert things, solve this, blah, 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 I still wouldn't know why he was doing those steps. I need comments to tell me why you're doing all these things, right? Not what you're doing. That's, that's, that's part of the problem is you feel this need to put a comment saying what you're doing because it's not obvious what you're doing because you don't have a function name. Once you have a function name, you can let your comments tell you why you're doing it instead of what it is you're doing. Yes? Um, I want to say an article. I don't remember the author, but he said that once it creates a small function, it inherently creates an order of, okay, this function has to be called after this function. Whereas if they're put in, in a series code block, then it's much more explicit that this is what it's doing. Right. So you're carrying a lot of space between these steps as well, which would be. Yes. So okay. So the, the just to repeat, if you start putting these things in into functions, you will end up having, you know, you must call this function before you call that function. That's just if you do it badly. Like, and you'll have too many parameters. Was the other comment that you know, there's so much state that before and after here. But I don't think there is. I think you fill out two vectors, and that's that's the point of this code. And the rest of the code doesn't like. There's probably one or two params and and one or two outputs. Yes. The point of having to declare the parameters is because probably the step group includes some stuff from step one that step two doesn't, and that's where you get a lot of explicitness in what steps are using. And it's so much easier to see in your code. I think that's a lesson, not a what you all have. Yeah, if I can rephrase that for the thing. Um, if you start breaking up these chunks into functions where you pass parameters in and parameters come out. You can e more easily see the dependencies of the code that maybe step two doesn't need anything from step one and step three needs the answers. And then actually maybe that tells you that step one and two could be paralyzed or something. Like you can then see what the relationships in your code is instead of just being the same problem of, uh, that I was talking about at the beginning of how to isolate. If I change something way up here, does it affect this code down here? It's like, uh, I don't know, this function's a thousand lines long, right? If if it's isolated, then Whoa, wait a second. <laughs> Slow down here. We're just trying to do functions. But uh, what he said was, if you find you have large blocks of code that have a tendency to be used with these large blocks of functions, there might in the future be some way to put those together into some kind of object. But we're only in the 50s now. We're only at <laughs> subroutines. Yeah, that's. So we're, we're doing pre modern C. <laughs> uh, to me, subroutines must be modern C or postmodern, because I don't see them very often. <laughs> so that's, that's my point. I do not see them enough. And it is. Like, I've I spent a lot of time trying to figure out 
I review a lot of code and I'm trying to figure out what is it, that, what first, what do I, what's my, my number one comment? And, and like, what would make code better? And I used to think it was making objects and would make code better and all these other things that'll make code better. And it's like, no, writing functions. How hard is that? Hard. So good code is reasonable, meaning it is reason, you are able to reason about it, readable, understandable. Those first three are all the same, it's just reasonable. Like if you can read and understand, that means you can reason about it. And if you can reason and understand, you can change it. And I don't actually, like I said, I don't really care how reusable the code is. Even if it happens once, if you put it into a function, into this thing called subroutine, uh, you can more easily reason about the code. Um, good code also works correctly. Don't forget that one. So that's, that is the question, right? Why is this hard? We all have bad code in our code bases. I, I, I sent myself an email saying 500 line constructor and I'm like, I don't remember where I saw it or whatever and what I wanted to say, but I'm pretty sure it had something to do with this is like, why is there a 500 line constructor, right? Like what's the chances that thing went wrong somewhere? What's like, constructor should be small and simple. Uh, like you said, like a thousand line function, that's, you know, have you seen 10,000 line functions? Yes, right? Oh, yeah. I, I've seen it by 6,000. I know I've gotten close. I know I've gotten close to 10. I've seen giant switch statements. Yes? I don't want to see your bad code. <laughs> oh, let me, Bryce, I make sure that everyone knows. Unless, of course, he's proud of it. Yeah, maybe he's proud of his, his giant constructor. Um, so tell me, what is the reason why we have this? Like, it's. Turns out it's not because subroutines are brand new. There must be another reason. Uh, and some people will probably say it's laziness. You know, like, ah, I was just writing this code. I didn't really want to separate it. Yes? The 70,000 line function that I had to debug because the architect said, we can't split it up into functions. We don't want to pay for the overhead of the function call. Yes, uh, 70,000 <laughs> lines. That's. Well, you know, you saw at the beginning of the uh, David Wheeler's paper said you don't actually need functions to write a program. So you could just have it all in main, right? Uh yeah, you know, pay, pay for pay for that function call. Um I think one of the problems is focus. And it's not lack of focus, it's too much focus. You're focused on the problem at hand. You're focused on like getting these bits to do what you want, get the computer to do its job because Damn it! I need this to happen. I need these pixels to go out the door. Blah 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 blah, and it's like you're not thinking about what your code looks like. Like that's and and you know we've got pressure to get the code done, make it work. Blah blah blah. We don't have pressure to make the code pretty. Yes. I like to give an alternative. Yes. Why uh, this doesn't happen? Uh, what, one of the challenges that I, I've had in my code with this principle is context. It can be really hard to carry. For, for the reader of the code, enough context from where the function is called to where the function is defined, if, if for whatever reason, there's a lot of kind of mental context that you have to carry there in order to understand what is happening. Uh, and and, and that, that can kind of provide pressure to not extract code into functions. And one of the things that I really like about Super Plus 11 is that increasingly, when I have that situation, I can partially address it by using a lambda so that I'm still structuring the code as a function, but without requiring the reader to make that context for me. I still get to put a name on it, but I, I just use like a name variable lambda, right? Which has all of the nice readable properties of a function, but it stays embedded in the context of that one place where it was important. Okay, wait. I'm gonna repeat I'm gonna repeat every single word he said exactly. Um, I, I, it's the same thing, yeah, I'll repeat the words he didn't say and you will understand what he really meant. Um, I, I will, yeah, so the first word he said was context and I agree. When you're, you're, you're writing code, you're in this context and if you start splitting the code up into functions over here and functions over there, you find yourself, oh wait a second, I have to go look at exactly what that function does and then you pop back and you go back and forth. And I, I knew a guy who wrote, like 90% of his code was maybe every function was like five lines at max. Like that is a big function to him. His functions were like two lines because all they did was call another function, right? Like 
And you're like, they do one thing, call another function. One thing, call another function. And it is. It's like a forest that you can't see what's really going on. Because you're like, OK, got, what's this function do? I mean, if you name them really well, you can like, oh, I know exactly what that function does. I don't have to go look at it. But that's hard to do, right? Naming is hard. Um, so yeah, that, that I, I completely agree with you. And this is why I put a question. This is why this is a question, because I wanted someone to give me the good answer of, uh, you tend to code in, in this context. You have all these things in your mind. And if you start splitting things out, first, you've got to think about them slightly differently, because you start thinking about how they get reused and everything. And, and you lose, what was the context I was trying to solve? Um, I will say, on the other hand, if you separate it out nicely, and you give it a good name, you can now drop context. You don't have to think about that anymore because that function does what it's supposed to do, right? And it's like, I don't, that, that is step one. I don't have to think about all this context, all these lines of code. I think of convert the 2D to 3D. That's, that's it. I never have to think about it anymore. Um, the other point uh, Chandler made, uh, which is I'm seeing it in our code as well, is to use lambdas inside your function. So we have some, get there. I'm still repeating Chandler in, in my own words in the non-words of, of Chandler. Um, we have a lot of code like that too, where the function is getting pretty big, but there's a bunch of lambdas in it, and then you call the lambda. And now the problem I've seen is our lambdas are called fn, right? And you've just lost the whole point, right? So you name your lambda something really well, so you can say, look, I know that I'm in this context. I don't have to go looking for where this is. It's right here, and I still feel like I'm in the same mind space. And, but I give this chunk of code, step one, I give it a real name that's convert 2D to 3D, and I don't have to think about, is that the right naming convention for the rest of the code? I don't have to think about, is this going to be useful? Is it generic enough to be a function of its own? It's like, no, it's right here, it does its job, and I also know that the, some, some temporary variables inside that lambda don't escape anywhere else, and I can forget about those variables. There's a whole bunch of state I can forget about because it's trapped in the lambda and, and it's done with, right? Now. I can't test a lambda. A local lambda. A local lambda. Yes. So we've lost one of Wheeler's uh, original testing in, in isolation. I can't test that lambda. That's a good point. Trade-off. Um, that's what I wanted to say about functions. So uh, you know, I like this whole idea of deconstructivism, but it can be taken too far. There are no bits. There's only bytes. Don't deconstruct your bits to bytes, or don't, don't deconstruct your bytes down to bits. There's only powers of two. Don't deconstruct further. And of course, JF once again comes in with the, in C++ there's only destruction, and Thomas Rogers and ruin. <laughs> um, what do I have to say about this? Um, originally, I actually wrote this tweet because I wanted to complain about standard byte, but I've done a lot of that already, and I, I'm, I'm just going to live with standard byte the way it is. Um, but I find it weird. I, I, I started doing this, giant, fell into the giant rabbit hole of asking questions like, can I, make my, can I make the number one in my implementation of the standard actually be the number 17 in the, in the machine? But you just never see it, because I'll always convert it back. I'll always like, subtract 16 or whatever. Like, Can I do this? And you don't ever see it. But, but people tend to think of, when they start thinking of bits and bytes, they think, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm at the machine level now. It's like, no, you're not. You're still kind of at this value level. You're still the, the, the integer value. And then you get really confused about the bytes of an int versus an unsigned, and like, am, am, like you know, I'm starting to do the machine thing. And so often, you should never go there. Just stop going down there. Stay at this value world. Um, and if you go read the, the standard, you know, the fundamental unit of storage is the byte, and it's composed of a sequence of bits, contiguous bits. We don't define what bits are, but we actually reference. Not only do we reference, you know, other standard things. We, there's a there's a terminology standard that we reference, so it's probably defined in there. I like this part. The least significant bit is called the lower bit. The most significant bit is called the higher bit. We don't define what that means. Significant. I think it means the most important bit. Um, but it. But it's okay because the only other place you'll find the phrase low order bit and high order bit is in the appendix, re referencing back to here. <laughs> and then we define things like bytewise operator. The results of bytewise and is the uh, bytewise function of the operators. Bitwise. Bitwise, sorry, yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Bitwise. Bitwise is defined by doing bitwise. 
That's it. That's, that is the definition. And this is not defined for the sake of operator overloading. This is at the level of integer and stuff. Yes, Chandler? Bit fields are just bytes that have been. <laughs> yes, you know when I was writing this up, I, I the, the same thought came to my mind. What about bit fields? I'm just like, screw those, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, in my mind, this is the implement. This is my implementation of the standard. It is a piece of graph paper, and you write numbers in the cells, right? I never write bits. I can implement C++ on that graph paper. It's hard, <laughs> but, but that, that's, that's what you have to work with. You have numbers to work with. You don't have bits to work with. If you, I, I swear, if you start thinking that way, it'll help you somewhere down the road. Uh, another topic. Oh, so some guy was doing a postmodern error handling in Python, blah, blah, blah. And so, of course, Patrice is my, my biggest fan about this postmodern stuff. He's, he's like asking me, he, he, like he's, please make sure it's recorded and all this stuff. So he sends me stuff when he sees postmodernism. Um, and I read and read about it, and the guy admits he doesn't understand what postmodern means and stuff. And then like Andrew Pardo, who's like a senior manager at Microsoft, uh, like Visual Studio, that kind of stuff. Um, he's like sending me links to actual postmodernism stuff. I'm like, okay, wait a second. I don't want people who actually know what postmodern is all about. Um, and there's another guy, Jean-Francois Lyotard, uh, who's one of the founders of postmodernism. And if you go off and read the wiki page, and this is where I've learned all my postmodernism is just off of wiki pages. Um, he basically comes to this conclusion uh, that there's no universal answer to error handling. Like everything else in C++, the answer is it depends, which goes back to um, your comment on you can't test lambdas, right? It's like, well, it's a technique. Is it, should you use it here? Should you use it there? The answer is it depends, right? Um, you can also see my, like, how, how to fit things into 140 characters. Every C++ question, answer equals it depends. So it's really running out of letters there. Um, and I do that at work all the time. That's, that's what I'm known for is someone asks me, like, how should I do this? And what's our guideline for this? And blah, blah, blah. And it's like, and if you work in, most other language, I would say, you don't have this problem. <laughs> Except Perl, yes. There's, <coughs> is Perl a language? I, it's not, you can't read it. Yeah. I thought it was, I thought it, I thought it was uh, line noise. Like, um, yeah, that's the weird part. Um, so to me, it depends is the curse of the multi-paradigm language, right, that we work with. If you go work in like Java or something, and someone says, oh, how should I do that? And you're like, you do it the Java way. Like, there's no, there's like, this is it. You use this pattern, off you go. And then like, in C++, it's like, oh, how should I do this? I'm like, okay, are you worried about memory? Are you worried about speed? Are you worried about, you know, what your code looks like? You know, like, I, I hate allocators. I, John is already like, cornered me saying, we must talk about allocators. He, he must convince me. He doesn't like that I, that I go around saying I hate allocators. I hate allocators. Um, but I hate them because they make the code look ugly and everything. Like they get in the way of like standard pair has, takes an allocator and its constructor and all these problems. But go to John's talk, an allocator can be a 10 times speed up. Well, okay, that's, that's a, you know, I love allocators now, right? <laughs> but, but I still hate them coding wise, but it's, it's a trade off. And we are the language that, how many other languages do you spend years of work on allocators, right? You don't, as the, not, not as the language implementer, but as the coder yourself, right? Most languages, there's all these problems that are covered over, and we choose to be like, no, these considerations are important considerations. I like to have that flexibility that I will give you a different uh, answer for every particular context that you're working in. Um, but that is actually not the uh, error handling tweet that I had in mind. I already had an error handling tweet that I was going to, and it was this one. The postmodern audience is aware of the conventions used by authors, so error handling code needs to understand to who it speaks. So what I mean by this is tropes, right? So if I walk to the middle of the stage and I lower my voice and I put these things on a list with my fingers, then you know I am saying something important. 
And if I repeat it three times, it's something important. It's something important. It is something important. That's a trope, right? <laughs> so, you know, we all, wherever you're working, the code base you're working in, the code bases you've worked with before, you have these patterns that you use, and the people you're working with have certain, they see code, they think they know what it means based on the pattern you're using and everything. Oh, here's my other trope, in case, I, you know, in case I didn't want to do my little skit. Wasn't sure about it. Right, Monty Python, right? It's like, I'm gonna sing. No, no, no singing here. No singing. Right, they, they're, they're, that, you know, I, I might say Monty Python's a postmodern, uh, a postmodern text, because in postmodernism, everything you're critiquing is a text. Doesn't matter if it's a movie or whatever, you say it's a text. So, Monty Python is a postmodern text. Um, because they know what the tropes are, and they know that as an audience, you know what the tropes are, and it's like, I know you know that we know, and so we're gonna talk at the, you know, we're gonna make fun of the tropes. Or you might, not make fun of them, but use them knowingly that the people you're talking to know what the tropes are. So the tropes of error handling are things like exceptions and error codes, uh, logging, termination, a message to the user, things like that. Waiting for someone to mention optional and expected and all those. Because you know you can't go through a talk nowadays without saying monad. <laughs> Do you see what I did there? I said it just by referring to it in the you can't say it. It's kind of meta. Because um, I'm not saying it otherwise. To avoid that word. Because uh, actually, in, 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 my, uh, in this, what I'm about to do here, to me, actually, exception and error codes and optional and things like that are kind of in the same category. Because what I really want, I think I did have an insight one day about error handling. And when you, when you have uh, disappointment in your C++ code, this is a great uh, paper by Lawrence Crawl. And he has the same sort of, slightly different, he included long jump you know, as one of the tropes of, of return handling. But whenever you start talking about error handling, people will start arguing about what's an error, right? It's like, well, it's not an error because it returned an exception like it said it would. It's like, it, you know, it, it completed its contract and all this kind of stuff. So it's like, let's avoid what an error is, let's just call it disappointment. So if you have a piece of code and you've got some disappointment you see is looming, um, what do you do, right? I think to answer that question, you have to look at who do I want to tell about this disappointment? And maybe you want to tell yourself as the guy writing the library. Maybe you're writing this library and you realize, oh, you know, you put in a check that, I'm just gonna put this check in for this null that should never happen, because that can't happen now in this stage of the program. But I'm gonna assert on it and check it anyhow. And then, of course, it happens. Well, who do you want to tell about that? The code's running somewhere else in the world, but you want to tell you, the guy who wrote the code, right? So that is your audience for that kind of error. Um, but the error might be as a result of, so that might be just like you've screwed up internally, but the error might be a result of the guy calling you, right? The calling code passed you something, and you say, I can't, I can't handle that, I'm gonna return you an error, right? It's like, please open this file, and you say, file not found. That might be an error to the calling code, Right? That is different than an error to the calling developer. You want to tell the calling developer that he screwed up, that you know, null is never the right thing to pass me. You don't want to tell the calling code because obviously it's not going to handle it because it should never have given you a null in the first place. Right? That's the case where it's like, this is an error that you want to tell the calling developer. And then you also have the end user. So at some point along the way, you might want to mention to the end user that something's gone bad. Right? And my whole point of this is that Figure out who it is that you want to tell, and then figure out how you're going to tell them, right? The first couple, like exceptions and error codes, you want to tell the calling code. That's who you're trying to talk to. You're saying, hey, calling code, something went wrong. Here's what went wrong. I know you can deal with that, right? If you want to talk to the calling developer, error codes might not be the best way because the code can't handle it if you're trying to talk to the developer. So to talk to the developer, maybe you need some logging, maybe you just want to terminate, let the developer know, you know, Unfortunately, those things don't get back to the developer, possibly, unless he's running in, you know, locally in debug and everything. When I was at um, BlackBerry, we were writing libraries on the, on the device, and you know, I assume that the guy who's writing an app is running the app himself before he gets, sends it off to the, to the world. So we would log 
you know, if he makes a mistake in calling me, I log that to his log file. If I make a mistake in my own code, I log it to a different log file. We had a system log file that was like, ooh, we screwed up, <laughs> right? But there's a, because we were using Qt, Qt has its own logging mechanism. So we would use that, assuming that that's what the developer is looking for. But I wouldn't log my errors through that because sometimes there was things that, you know, because of security and whatever, I have to log it differently. Um, and at the end of the day, you probably want to tell the end user. So even if you use termination, you know, you're telling the end user, right? That's, <laughs> it's not the best message, but you're telling the end user. So I don't want to actually talk about which one's the best. It's more of realize who it is you're trying to talk to. The other problem, of course, is sometimes you don't know if you want to talk to the calling code or the calling developer because, you know, file not found. You think, well, that's probably the calling code. Passed me a, passed me a, a function name. Probably came from the user or something because he tried to open a file and something like that. And it's like, oh, file not found. You, and it propagates all the way back up. And the other thing is obviously some of these things you'll talk to more than one person. You talk to the calling code and eventually it talks to the user. But if that file not found was like a hard-coded file name because it's the config file that must be in this program, well, then you probably want to talk to the developer because he screwed up on his hard-coded file name. Problem is sometimes in your code, as being the guy he's calling, you don't know which of these cases it is. So that, that's the secondary problem. But still, please think about who you're trying to talk to when you try to talk about errors. OK, that's that. Uh, so there was, uh, on, in the standards committee, there's this new function called standard launder. I'm sure we all know what that does. Um, it's good that you don't know what it does, as it turns out. It's kind of a low-level function. Um, and there was national body comments saying, that is a bad name. I don't know what that function does. And I really wanted to like propose, we reply with, standard launder is a perfectly cromulent name. It's probably not a good thing to do to a national body. They might, they might just like try to sync the whole standard. Um, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, a Canadian wouldn't do that. We're so nice, I'll, you know. By the way, welcome to Canada, looking at the snow outside. Um, and, and the point is like, look at the word cromulent, right? Made up word, whatever, but we all kind of know what it means. And you just, it ends up getting meaning. And standard launder is going to be one of those. It's like, first of all, it's, it's all about uh, uh, pointer aliasing, blah, 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 that you don't, most 99% of the time your code doesn't need to ever look at this function. So it's one, good that it's a name that you don't know what it does because you should avoid it. And, and two, it actually, if you figure out what the function is really doing, it's not a bad name. It, it applies to the name. And it just becomes, your brain will put the meaning together and it'll be fine, just like cromulent. We, we know what cromulent means now. But uh, this is my excuse to talk about naming. I don't want to talk about all of these because that's like a whole talk of its own, but this is my list of, of naming. Uh, I, I sometimes, even in, in committee emails and stuff, I'd be like, that's, rule, that's my rule of naming number five. And someone's like, do you have rules of naming? It's like, well, I should. So I finally wrote them down. I used to just make up numbers. Um, so that, that, that first yellow one there, not understanding is better than misunderstanding. That's exactly what standard launder does. You're not, gonna, you're not gonna guess wrong as to what that function does, right? You're just gonna not understand. Um, something like, uh, there's a proposal for observer pointer, right? It's a pointer called observer pointer. What's that do? You're just like, oh, I know the observer pattern. I probably know what observer pointer does. And it's like, nope, that's not what it does. It has nothing to do with the observer pattern. So it's a name that starts heading you in the wrong direction, right? So possibly that's, a, that's the wrong name. It actually describes what an observer pointer is uh, fairly well, but, but because the, you know, the context of where we're programming, that word already has meaning, you can't have it, right? Um, so sometimes it is better to just co-opt a term. All of our, all the terms we have now, like cast, like where, where did that, you know, it had slightly different meaning and we're like, it kind of means this, so that's what we're gonna use it for. Um, in, in Boost, there was a while ago, there was a talk about a function that would, uh, it's kind of like a partition sort, but wasn't exactly a partition sort, but it would separate things into groups. Each group wasn't necessarily sorted, but it was stratified, basically. It looked like stratification of, 
And someone said, let's call this function stratify. And it's like, great, no one is using that name. And it also describes what it does. So it's just like, okay, from now on, stratify means this. If, you know, like you can't use it. The guy's taking the name, it's done, right? I don't know if that ended up getting into boost actually or not, but. Um, so uh, one of the other ones I like is be glaringly inconsistent. And you can only do this if you are consistent, which is the, the first, even though it's not first, it's the first rule of APIs and stuff is to be consistent. Um, if you look at all our smart pointers and optional and, and uh, expected and all these things, some of them have reset, some of them have, you know, you can check for empty, some of them has value. There's all these things that are the same, but they all had different names. So uh, a guy named Vicente sat down and said, let's make this consistent, right? And so now optional and any and expected and all, all of these functions all have the same name, has value, right? And then variant has valueless by exception. And you're like, why isn't it just called has value? And it's like, we purposely want it to be diff look different because it is different. Because you can go around checking for has value on an optional. That's a fine, normal thing to do. You should probably never be checking for variant uh, valueless by exception because that's there's different things. Even though it looks the same on the surface, there's different things going on. So it's purposely uh, inconsistent. And uh, this is like a postmodern way of doing API, right? It's like here's the nice patterns of things. If we suddenly go against pattern, it should stand out. And you should only go against pattern when you want it to stand out. And you can't do that unless you have consistent pattern. Um, and this one I, I've added in yellow because last time I ever talked about this, I didn't have this as a rule. It's my new rule. Um, think of standard map. Why is it called map? It's called map because I think the essence of it is, you know, mapping a value. You, you, you say, Key, key to value. You say, give me from this key, map it to a value. So it's called map. Great. Is the fact that it's also ordered an essential property of standard map? Yes. yes, it is. But it's not called ordered map. It's just called map. And it, you know, you're like, oh, who cares? But this has come up with like this is it becomes. I think it ends up being tied to. Let's make all our types default sortable and all this, all this stuff that's going on in the standards committee right now. And, and it's, you know, because you could imagine someone who wrote map a different way where, like in another language where you just hash all the values or you just, in a language that everything's on the heap, you could just use the, the pointer to, to map values and other ways of doing maps. So, so in a sense, we shouldn't have called map map. We should have called it ordered map to be specific. So when you name something, you got to decide what is essential to this thing and what isn't. And then once you figure out what is essential, you got to decide does my API actually, you know, follow that. The problem here is to not say, well, I've got eight essential things in my API, so my names are going to look like this, right? Just be long. Just put all these words together. The entertainment provider view controller. No one's ever seen languages that have a tendency for this, right? Um, so that's that's my 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 naming stuff. Um, where am I for timing? I'm just flying. I've got till 4:30. No, I've got four o'clock, so I'm not flying. I'm 20 minutes. Where's where's the? You're right there. Right? I've been I've been, I've been looking at. Okay. Um, nan is the number that is not a number, and void is the type that is not a type. What is the not a concept concept? So I just want you to try, try to get your brain to figure that out. Of course, J, JF once again comes in with the win, saying, uh, it's the only concept we have. We don't have any concept yet. What was that? Auto. Good guess. Peter Dimov said the same thing. Auto is the, not a concept, but he has, we have reasons why. So the first thing up there is a uh, templatized uh, lambda thing, whatever they're called. So you've got auto A, auto B, and then in the concept world, if number is a concept, in the concepts TS, you've got number A and B, right? So very similar, but one's just more, gen more general, right? 
where n number is a concept. And we want to think of auto as the, as the most general concept. As it turns out, when you see this line, whatever type number is, A and B must be the same type. Not just the same concept, they're the same type. But A and B at the top, that auto is not the same as the other auto. Just like NAN. NANs are not equal to NAN. So yes, I completely agree with you. Auto is the not a concept concept. Um, so this slide is here, so, and this whole thing is here so I can complain about, uh, rant on about this. Um, in this concept TS, uh, number, number, number are all three the same type. This number it used in the code somewhere, it could be a different type. Because in the concepts TS you can just use, which I'm, I'm dying to do. I, I actually don't like auto, almost always auto thing. When I do like uh, iterator equals vector.begin or something, I don't want to say auto iterator equals vector.begin. I want to say iterator or forward iterator or whatever it is my code following requires. Just like in a template, you want to have a concept to say the code inside this template requires this concept. In a line of code here, the code that follows has requirements on this type. I don't care exactly what the type is, but I do have requirements on it, so I want to specify what my, why my requirements are. If suddenly this becomes, you know, I might be doing adding on this, and if suddenly, if I had put auto here and somehow it became a string, it would still compile and it would add strings, but it's like, no, that's not what I meant by adding. Right? I didn't mean concatenation. Um, this one's nice. All the args here don't have to be the same type because it's a var arg thing. This one, this one, and this one are the same type, but these can be a different type. Uh, and then if we go back to the normal world without concepts, if we just had a, an interface class, right? Here's a writable and there's another writable. Obviously those don't have to be the same uh, you know, derived type. They just have the same base type. And good old int, guess what? X and Y don't have to have the same value. But to, con, the value of a concept is a type, and the value of a type is a, val is a value, right? Like concepts are to types as types are to values. So uh, me and Botan wrote a paper on this, and it has come to the committee two or three times now, and we haven't talked about it yet. Because there's always been a reason, and very valid reasons for, let's talk about that next time. But every time we don't talk about it, we add more reasons. I've got like, I can just, keep adding. Some of these I did, we didn't even know when we first wrote it. And it's like, man, we've got so many reasons for why this is the, we, we need to change this, is my opinion. Um, however, uh, there's people I respect who disagree with me. Uh, you know, people who, like Andrew Sutton, who is writing concepts. So he probably knows more about concepts than I do. So whenever this topic comes up, I think to myself, what if I'm wrong, right? And there's this great talk on a TED Talk by Catherine Schultz on being wrong. She's, she studies being wrong. That's what she does for a living. Um, and you should just watch it, but I will just jump to the crux, what I think is the crux of it. How does it feel to be wrong? Anyone? Right. Have you seen the talk? <laughs> yes, it feels just like being right. Because when you're wrong, you don't realize you're wrong. When people think like, oh, I hate it when, I, when, it, when I'm wrong because it feels bad, blah, blah. It's like, no, that's when you realize you were wrong. While you're wrong, you think you're right. And it feels just the same. So I, I will keep in my mind that I might be wrong about that whole concept thing, even though I've got like a giant list of reasons why I think it's great. And I put in a small list of reasons from Andrew and other people why they, they think it should go the other way. Ah, oh, right, yeah. I, got, I have to move quickly now. Uh, what is a postmodern smart pointer? By now we understand what postmodernism is. We should all understand what is a postmodern smart pointer. A raw pointer used well. A raw pointer used well. I would say close, but you're not following the pattern of modern programming. A raw pointer never used. <laughs> What's that? An ironic, raw. An ironic raw pointer? Very close. The world's dumbest smart pointer. <laughs> right? That's the observer. It's, it's currently on the name observer pointer, even though I don't like the name. Uh, which, if you don't know, is a, a, a wrapped up smart pointer style pointer that doesn't do anything, doesn't, own, doesn't have ownership, doesn't, but it's to mark in your code base that, hey, look, I don't own this pointer. I think it should be called not my pointer or... Um, There's a whole list of names in this paper. There, I, yeah, but I have more because... Send them to Walter 
Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, going back to how to name things, caged pointer, which you're like, what does caged mean? But if you look it up, it means to borrow and not give back. Because it's, it's like, what? what? <laughs> it's, it's like beg, borrow, steal kind of, there's a word for that. Because um, it was called borrow, pointing, borrow pointer, I would expect part of the API to, to be like, I'm lending and now I'm done. But caged pointer is like, I'm just, I'm just going to use this and not tell you. Um, I would also call it the ephemeral pointer because it kind of just, and then we could just call it like effy pointer as a short form and then maybe effin pointer. Right? <laughs> um, oh, yes, this, this is my last, my last tweet. Um, not my last slide, but my last tweet. And this is to me, this is like beautiful code. This is my beautiful tweet in my mind, right? So if you read this sentence here and if you were a, uh, postmodern literary critic thing and you were just, you know, you were in the humanities, you would read this first sentence, you'd say, two readers reading the same source, you know, the same text, the same uh, book or whatever, may see different values due to what each has read and wrote previously, right? Depending on your previous experiences, you will, look, you will get different things out of this story, out of this book, right? But no, no, we're programmers. So when I say source, I mean source, right? And two readers reading the same source code might get different impressions of that source code. You might think, oh, I know what he's doing here, but you might be wrong, or you might see it one way. I think this was meant to be, you know, I think the code was meant to do that and really meant to do something else. But wait, that's only two levels, two different ways to read this, this statement. This is how, you know, I said I wouldn't talk about, about lock free. This is the C memory model, right? Where readers are CPUs. Two CPUs reading the same address may see different values due to what they have read and, and written previously, based on you know, the ordering of your instructions and stuff like that. So this is actually a quote about lock-free. But if you remember my first quote, I said you can't talk about lock-free in 140 characters. It gets cut off. So it's, it's like, every one of my tweets about postmodern are exactly 140 characters, except for the one about uh, you know, why do we program at all. Because you have to have one that breaks the rule, right? That's, that's all. So, conclusions. Uh, this is some of the comments by the programming committee when I said I would like to talk about this at the conference. <laughs> and I love, I get these a lot because the first year I gave a talk here, no one knew who I was, and I wrote like a 30 pages about lock-free programming. I say, this is what I want to talk about. And you can go online, it's, it's part of my notes now on the lock-free stuff. Um, because I'm like, I don't know what, and after a few years, I'm just like, hey, I'm going to talk about lock-free again. That would be my abstract, right? <laughs> just like, I don't know, the programming committee knows who I am, I hope. And then it turns out we keep rotating people on the programming committee, so some of them are like, who is this guy? What, what, what the heck is he talking about, right? Um, but there's always usually someone, I think one year, it was Bryce one year that uh, saved me, basically. Because there was like, I had bad reviews, and then Bryce is like, no, 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 wait, wait, wait. <laughs> he really means this. Let me translate for you. Um, but in my reviews, and I, so I don't blame these people at all for, I totally agree, and maybe they're right that this was a big pile of insanity. Um, as Chandler said, the word context, someone in my really badly done abstract and stuff said, it appears to have context as a central driving theme. And I was like, wow, maybe that is what it's all about. Because I didn't know what it, I was like, I'm gonna, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to, I don't know who it was. I have to find out who's, who's the good reviewer there. It's like, man, you, you've got this better than I do. Um, but it is, that's what I want to talk about. Context, what context are you, are you writing your code in? Uh, communication, how do we communicate to other developers, right? And, and the postmodern movement is basically comes to the conclusion of you can't, you, you know, it's, communication is impossible. Um, oh, and I, I still had one more tweet, by the way. Mind control of the audience. So I stood up here and my brain and my brain waves caused actions and sounds to come out of my voice. And I think at least one of you had thoughts put into your brain by me, right? I controlled your mind. I said pink elephant, and then you're like, I'm thinking about pink elephant now. I don't want to think about a pink elephant. So, <laughs> so that was, you know, that was mind control. But that's, that's what communication is, right? I'm trying to get a thought from my brain to your brain. And when you're programming, it's worse. It's not just between two smart individuals that we're trying to communicate. We're trying to, to communicate with like a dumb compiler, a dumb computer, possibly dumb end users and you, the dumb developers you work with, right? Um, some of them hopefully are smart, but we have a much harder problem. We have to communicate to all these people at the same time in 
in our code and we're constrained by syntax, like in Twitter where you're constrained by 140 characters. We're not quite that constrained. I should write a Twitter compiler that all your code has to be tweets. Um, <laughs> but I, th I think one of the problems is we are too focused on communicating to the computer, right? When we write code, we communicate with the computer and we forget everybody else. And like, how many developers do you know that like hate doing UI code? They don't want to talk to the end user, right? You guys are, what, what's better? What, I, I missed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, the, I really tried in my craziness of this talk to get you thinking at different levels at the same time. When I, I, I've, I, for years, I've been trying to figure out how do I interview people and how do I pick programmers? I do a lot of interviewing, hire a lot of people. And I don't, I, like everyone else I work with has like, here, let's give them this problem, let's do whiteboard, let's do this and this. I'll just sit down and talk to somebody for an hour or whatever and it's like, Let's talk about the weather, let's talk about, like I, I remember going in a, in a taxi, talked to the taxi driver about the weather or something, and he was like detailed about the weather, and then he was high level about the weather, and then he was like up and down, and, and I'm like, this guy's a programmer. Just like, he talks like a programmer, he thinks like a programmer, and he thinks at multiple levels at the same time. And I think that's key to writing good code. I was so tempted to say, without being rude, saying, you know, do you like being a taxi driver? Like, because you might want to consider going to programming. But, um, and we're always making, like at the very beginning, you know, I, I had reasons for my craziness. At the beginning of the talk, I started talking about lock free because you guys all had an assumption I wasn't, I was gonna talk about something else, right? So I just jumped, because, and when we're doing code, we, we come in with assumptions and they're often wrong. So, um, and so we need to be aware and uh, ambiguity, right? Uh, and one of the questions about all this is how do you get in the habit of thinking this way? Like, I don't know if you can teach people I have this theory that you really can't teach people to code. Either they think like a coder or they don't. Um, but I'm trying to think of ways to like get people in the habit. And one of them is just like puns. If you just start doing puns and you get in this habit of doing puns, I, I'm going to claim it makes you a better programmer. Because then you start thinking about things more than one way, right? And you might see ambiguities. Because when you write your comments in your code, there's no ambiguities. You know exactly what you're doing. You come back a month later and there's ambiguities, right? And you can't be, oh, I'm gonna get rid of all ambiguities by being crazy verbose so that there's no questions about anything. But you have to realize that they might be there. This was a headline yesterday. Human brain mimicking AI platform conquers media summarizations looks to expand. I'm like, whose human brain is this? That's, why is there a human brain mimicking an AI platform? Like this, none of this makes sense to me, right? I'm just like, and it was like a big headline in the major paper or whatever. And so to get rid of the, you know, to make this correct, it doesn't have to be twice as long. You could say an AI platform that mimics the human brain. That's three extra letters because if you do a lot of tweets, you, you just know how, to, <laughs> you know, got to keep your letter count. Um, or you could just put dashes right here and here. Uh, human brain mimicking AI, and you know, that's no extra layers, right? <sighs> like, I don't know. So, I hope people see things like this when they code, that it looks obvious to me that that, that was. The other th part of it is when, um, if you say, I saw a great movie on Monday, what's your first thought, right? You're like, ooh, what movie is it? My first thought is, they made a movie about Monday? Well, not they made a movie about Monday, but, yeah, it's same, similar. I'm like, what's so special about Monday? Do they only put the good movies on Mondays? I'm like, tell me more about Monday. And you're like, what are you talking <laughs> Like, well, why did you say Monday, right? Like, why didn't you say, I saw a great movie the other day? You're like, Monday must have been important. That same thing of like, why did you use this word, not these other words? But I do that constantly, and I have, you know, people at home that aren't too happy with them. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's a good mental pattern to get into. Um, so that, that is the real grasp per slide, by the way. That's, that, that it was cut off before that one of those, those, those uh, recursive slides had 21 graphs in them. And, and this, is, this is this graph. We're, we're on the last graph. And uh, I counted the giraffe as a half a, gra half a graph. <laughs> and that is the end of the talk. Unless you want bonus slides. <laughs> Questions? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I, I have bonus slides. I can do, in, I would like to do one bonus slide. If a bit seriously, any questions? I, I want to do a bonus slide because I'm thinking of my next talk. C++ cones. So we all know what a cone is. It's this nice long story that somehow there's enlightenment at the end. And I'm like, oh, I want to do those. And I was like, God, that's got to be hard. Like, how do you write a, a C++? Like, how do you, and then I was like, I want to tweet one. So it has to be 140 characters, right? Ah, let's gonna skip that one, not that one. People like this one. Near sprint n, master found the arguing n versus log n. She typed a solution, it was n squared. One left in, this, in disgust, the other enlightened. Does that make any sense? Is anyone enlightened? I'm hoping no, because no, I can't explain. You can't explain cones, that's not allowed. So maybe next time I will have more than four cones, but they're really hard to make. Uh, and then we'll just sit and discuss them. I only have like 10 slides and 10 cones and if I can build them up. Um, I like this one. Explain the rule of zero. Study the pointers of masters Hinnit and Dimov, but they have destructures as they should. Does that one make sense? Come on, people. <laughs> this is a great. Lock free master, we need a queue. So this, this happened, this happened yesterday. Uh, I, I, I was like, okay, I'm gonna write this. Everyone's like, oh, you're gonna write a lock-free queue. And I went and looked at our code base. We had a mutex queue. I'm like, okay, good, we're done. Yes? How many of these are exactly like characters? All of them. <laughs> you, you must commit. <laughs> the only thing I'm allowed is one versus two spaces between uh, sentences. I like to put two spaces between sentences. I will do one or two to like make sure it's 140 characters. Maybe I'll leave the period off the end if I have to. I've got a pretty strict set of rules. <laughs> this last one, uh, you know, this is a real. This this really happened, except for there was no master around. Uh, must do x first, and then it's y. It's like check git and spend a week looking for uh, why it says must do git first, and you find nothing, and then you're enlightened. No, see, this is exactly what a cone is supposed to be. You will not be enlightened unless you spend the week looking. <laughs> and then you will eventually be like, I cannot find what this comment means. How do you feel after you wasted the week? No, you're pissed <laughs> off. <laughs> then you're enlightened. Okay, no, really, that's the end. I have no more to say.